All right, picking up where I left off. Um, so before I close, uh, I want to just make a few comments about the diaspora and also how this gospelist tradition has continued uh, even uh, you know from the continent over into the diaspora. Um, there's a little known fact that um, that's I think really powerful, especially that helps to you know continue to inform us around this idea that Christianity has always been global um, and that it is not uh, kind of at its core linked to imperialism, colonialism, or oppression. Uh, and that is that not only was Christianity present and predominant, as we've mentioned, across the continent of Africa from the very beginning, but also that that Christianity continued to spread across Africa. Um, you know, even long before colonial ships arrived on the shores of West Africa um, and enslaving people in the name of Jesus Christ, but that there was long before that Christianity spread from African group to other African group. Um, I have a you know picture I want to show you. It's actually on the cover of my book, A Multitude of All Peoples, because I think it's so fascinating. But this is from a monastery in Nubia. And again, Nubia was a Christian nation from the fifth uh, century all the way up uh, for over a thousand years. And in one of the monasteries, uh, in Nubia, in the old capital of, of Nubia, or Makuria, the central Nubian region, uh, in the capital city of Dongola, there's a monastery that also goes back to uh, very early, about the 6th century. And uh, in the monastery, there's there's various paintings of angels and, um, and, and biblical figures, but there's an interesting painting in one of the rooms of a nativity where there's uh, Mary and baby Jesus and, uh, and angels, and uh, it's, it's a, you know, a room that's celebrating the nativity, and some people think it might have even been a maternity ward uh, in, the, in the monastery. But, um, but next, to the, um, next to Mary and Jesus, there's a collection of African figures that are worshiping and celebrating uh, and are exclaiming uh, various um, uh, praises and prayers and thanksgiving in the Nubian language, uh, which is, again, the oldest uh, sub-Saharan African language in the world. Um, and are uh, are celebrating the birth of Jesus, but the the clothing and the attire uh, and the musical instruments of these um, these unnamed African figures are are very distinct from what is more typical in Nubian paintings. So this is indicating these were not Nubians, but these are likely Central Africans that were located further to the west uh, and south of Nubia, and um, and there is you know uh, you know clear evidence of Christians. Uh, who had contact with Nubians, um, you know, that come from uh, 8th and 9th and 10th and 11th century chronicles of travelers who went across and throughout Africa that, that indicate that there was trade and commerce going on between Nubia and Ethiopia, which were Christian, and other Central African nations as they began to develop, like the kingdoms of Songhai, Mali, and, uh, and Ghana, and then also the kingdoms of the Congo and Great Zimbabwe that were trading with Nubia and Ethiopia, as well as other, you know, other further areas in Europe and India and the Middle East. And so uh, it makes all the sense in the world that Christianity would have also spread um, into Central, West, and South Africa, lo again, long before slavery. And if you look at this picture on the right, there's a zoomed in um, uh, picture of some of these Africans who are wearing animal masks, which is a very... Uh, common African practice in many sub-Saharan African uh, Bantu cultures, but this was not a common practice in Nubia. So what this tells us is that that according to the Nubian painter, that there were Central Africans who were Christians who celebrated the birth of Jesus Christ, and this painting was done likely in the 10th or 11th century, long before European colonialism uh, or before Christianity came in through the vehicle of colonialism. And um, and, and there are, again, other documents uh, that, especially from Muslim travelers uh, in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th century that were traveling across Africa, even some that indicated that there were, that clearly indicated that there were Christian communities in Central and West Africa. A famous example, or a, a really important example, not, not famous, but should be, a really, uh, well, a really uh, important example is from a 14, early 14th century historian, Ibn al-Dawadari, who who reported that Mansa Musa, the king of, of the Mali Empire in modern-day Ghana um, and, uh, and other parts of West Africa, that that king who controlled the gold trade and made him what was, some, by some accounts, the wealthiest person in, in, the, in the world in the early 1300s, uh, that he actually said that there were Christians in the Ghana Empire 
that uh, actually even controlled most of the gold trade in the in the Mali Empire, and that even though he was a Muslim and Mali was ruled by it had a Muslim leadership in the early 1300s, that there were Christians who coexisted and lived in West Africa in the 1300s, over a century before Europeans came to the shores of West Africa. And so what that shows is that Christianity was spreading all along the African continent, and it was spreading freely from African to African. And that that even in some cases, uh, you know, followed over through the transatlantic slave trade. Um, the, the kingdom of the Congo also, uh, through contacts with the Portuguese, freely embraced Christianity as their national religion in the 15th century. Um, you know, already in the 14 and 1500s, there were Congolese kings who were also theologians and, and wrote um, and, and uh, wrote on matters of church life. And, uh, and, and that there was a vibrant Congolese indigenous expression of Christianity. And, and, and uh, again, another little known fact is that some of those Christians, Congolese Christians, actually made their way over into the United States. Um, and, uh, and, and so what that means is that there were actually examples of African slaves who were brought over to the Americas who were already Christian. Uh, for whom their first introduction to Christianity was not from the people, the Europeans who stole them from their land and housed them in slave castles and uh, dragged them along the middle, pa the, the treacherous middle passage along the Atlantic and set them up on auction blocks in the Americas and the Caribbean uh, and then worked them and, and beat them in plantations and, and lynched them. That that was not the expression of Christianity that was first introduced for for some of the even victims, African victims of the transatlantic slave trade. But there were some who were already Christians that came from Christian regions like what we've discussed in Mali or in the Congo. Uh, one famous example, though, of documented evidence of such of such uh, American slaves who were already Christian was um, came in the wake of the Stono Rebellion. Uh, in 1739, this is uh, probably not as well known as the Nat Turner Revolt uh, in you know um, uh, in in slave days, but the Stono Rebellion was a another uh, rebellion of African slaves that started in South Carolina and was largely motivated uh, by um, some of the promises of freedom for uh, African slaves who were able to make their way into Spanish-controlled at that time Florida, and. Um, and so there were African slaves in South Carolina who uh, who rebelled and revolted against their uh, their kidnappers uh, in in South Carolina and um, and had began to uh, draw other African slaves uh, and African American slaves to their cause and fight against their captors and try to make their way to Florida and they were unfortunately ultimately uh, killed um, by uh, uh, by the white people of of South Carolina and uh, there were. Um, uh, publications and coverage of this revolt. And one of the uh, interesting things about this this revolt uh, and this rebellion was that it was actually, uh, while it encompassed uh, African and African-American slaves, it was actually started by initially Congolese slaves who spoke Portuguese and who were already Christians. Um, here's an excerpt from uh, one of the you know, newspaper, local newspapers that covered the event. It says, amongst the Negro slaves, there are a people brought from the kingdom of Angola in Africa. Many of these speak Portuguese, which, which language is as near Spanish as Scotch is to English, by reason that the Portuguese have considerable settlement, and the Jesuits have a mission and school in that kingdom, and many thousands of the Negroes there profess the Roman Catholic religion. Several Negroes joined them. They, calling out liberty, marched on with colors displayed and two drums beating. And so again, I think it's interesting that even white documentation of this uh, of this revolution that happened in 1739 indicates the fact that this slave revolt was started by African Christians who were already Christian and were part of an indigenous Congolese Christianity that they already had and and were as they were fighting for their freedom were shouting liberty. And so again, this gospelist expression of Christianity that had been spreading across Africa on the continent from the very beginning. Uh, in some cases, even made its way into the Americas and and still yet engendered in African slaves who were being told that they were less than human, told that they were descent, cursed descendants of Ham and were born to be slaves, that ha they had in their possession the true gospel and the true Christianity that urged them on to fight for freedom uh, like their white counterparts would do against the British uh, only a few, day, few decades later. 
Um, and so again, this, um, this holistic expression of Christianity that affirmed black humanity and the affirmed the reality of being made in the image of God, uh, the imago Dei, or to use the Ethiopian phrase, the Ereia Exi Aber, the image of God, uh, was clear among a gospelist African tradition of Christianity that has come through uh, the continent as well as into the diaspora. And and it, so it makes all the sense in the world that even in the face of a dominant imperializing Christian tradition that 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 uh, protects the interests of wealthy and uh, in, in, uh, and uh, the interests of the powerful and the interests of of domination, um, that among the uh, the African and African American slaves, even in the Americas, who would become Christians and theologians and church leaders that developed the black church uh, tradition in the in the U.S. the gospelist tradition, the gospelist hymenote that is holistic, and um, that it makes all the sense in the world that there was an ability on the part of these African people to distinguish between the true Christianity of Jesus Christ, the gospelist tradition of the New Testament Church, and what was being talked about and what was being uh, taught in the uh, in the. Christianity of slave holding and slave supporting United States of America. And we see that come to the fore um, in the uh, in the biography of Frederick Douglass, uh, who was an abolitionist and uh, one of the most prominent African Americans in the 19th century, uh, an ambassador to Haiti, and also uh, was, was born a slave and then later escaped to freedom and fought for the freedom uh, and for the rights of African American slaves and of women. And he, uh, I think, very poignantly distinguishes, uh, again, these... Uh, you know, kind of distinguishes a gospelist hymenote against a kind of imperialist religion that um, that was calling for for slavery, and he distinguishes these things uh, when he says that what I have said respecting and against religion, I mean strictly to apply to the slaveholding religion of this land, and with no possible reference to Christianity proper, for between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to receive the that to receive the one as good, pure and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave holding, women whipping, cradle plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religions of this land Christianity. And so, again, notice the way that Douglas con uh, contrasts the slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering Christianity that supported, again, the practices of slavery um, and, and also the genocide of indigenous peoples uh, in this country. And notice how he contrasts that from Christianity proper. So even Douglas, who was born a slave, had to endure the trauma and the, the horrors of slavery, was able to distinguish the... Um, and, and, and here, the true Christianity, even though uh, Thomas Jefferson and other folks had their own version of the Bible that that removed miracles and also had and, and also endorsed uh, slavery and and other versions of the Bible that in, that took out uh, passages that calling for liberation that that the Negro spirituals and the gospel tradition in of uh, Black Christians in this country still held firmly to the truth of the gospel and called for freedom and even strategized for freedom uh, and liberation of the oppressed. Um, in a similar way, there uh, was also a clear understanding of the of the rights of women uh, in the in in the African American church tradition that again was even reforming and calling for uh, full liberation not only of black people and black men but of women as well. Uh, the first, uh, just like uh, people like Walata Petros and and Christo Samra were. Christian leaders and evangelists and theologians were among the first African women to have their own biographies. In the same way, the first African-American woman to have her own biography was Jerina Lee, who was discipled and came up in the Mother Bethel Church of Philadelphia, which was the first church of the AME denomination, African Methodist Episcopal denomination, founded by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, who were literally thrown out of a white Methodist church and therefore started a black church that was at the forefront of preaching the gospel and justice issues and, and fighting for freedom and also even ministering during a yellow fever epidemic. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic now. And, and this church, this holistic uh, Christian uh, expression that started in Philadelphia and was the first black denomination and 
also the oldest piece of property continuously owned and operated by African Americans in the U.S. It was a church uh, and a house of God, a house of theology, of orthodoxy, and of justice, a gospelist ministry that yet still had some areas to grow in terms of empowering women because Jarena Lee came to this church and was initially, though she was called by God to preach, was was hindered by even Richard Allen and other men uh, in, in the uh, sanctuary, uh, in the church, who, uh, but then ultimately were proved wrong and realized that they, the hindrance they were putting on her was wrong and then uh, ultimately allowed her to preach. Um, and, and she was an evangelist that traveled all throughout the United States and again is the first African-American woman to have her own biography and makes the argument for, again, the full equality of women uh, in their ability and call to preach. She says, if the man may preach because the Savior died for him, why not the woman? Seeing he died for her also. Is he not a whole savior instead of a half one? As those who hold it wrong for a woman to preach would seem to make it appear. Did not Mary first preach the risen savior? And is not the doctrine of the resurrection the very climax of Christianity? Hangs not all our hope on this, as argued by St. Paul. Then did not Mary, a woman, preach the gospel? For she preached the resurrection of the crucified son of God. As for me, I am fully persuaded that the Lord called me to labor according to what I have received in his vineyard. If he has not, how could he consistently hear testimony in favor of my poor labors in awakening and converting sinners? So again, notice the way that this, this evangelist was, was completely enmeshed in the work of, of preaching the gospel, of converting people, of, of, of leading people from lostness into truth of of sharing the gospel of jesus christ and also enmeshed in the uh, in the freedom fight both against slavery uh and, and and supporting abolitionist movements and also in the in the fight for women's rights and so again and and this is the uh this is at the very core of african-american theology and church history this is a a tradition a gospelist tradition uh just as gospel music has been at the core of 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 the African-American religious tradition in the same way, the holistic nature of the gospel, uh, one that is that cannot perceive of a separation between truth and justice and, and the work of, of sharing the gospel and of leading people to faith in Christ and fighting for justice on the, on the behalf of the poor and the marginalized. This has been a cornerstone of African-American and African Christianity from the very beginning of our global common faith. And it is but one of many uh, fantastic witnesses to the the holistic nature of Christianity that we see in the New Testament, one in which truth is being declared by the apostles that there is no other name under heaven by which people may be saved except Jesus Christ alone, and at the same time are, are boldly acting out in Acts 4 and 5 in civil disobedience against injustice and saying uh, we have to obey uh, God rather than human beings and are deeply engaged in the work of community development, of healing the sick and, and, and sharing resources, placing wealth at the apostles' feet and giving to the point that no one among them had need. We see in the scriptures, we see in the scriptures the perfect expl explication and and picture of the holistic nature of the church. And again, the the moment that we're in, where we're seeing kind of um, justice and truth as somehow opposed or or dichotomous ideas, and we see uh, expressions of theology and Christendom that are are half full. Um, it's it's it uh it, it it's very encouraging to see and look at. Uh, and be reminded of not only the ultimate truth of the holistic gospelist nature of our faith, of our hymenote that we see in scripture, but also even to see that there have been witnesses, uh, maybe not as well known or not as well published um, or not as well um, promoted, but there have been uh, people throughout the, hist the 2000 history year of the church that have been witnesses to this biblical gospelist vision of our hymenote.